This is episode 91 of the Christian Travelers Network. Today we'll be talking about engaging Gen Z through retreats. Welcome to the Christian Travelers Network, where travel stories, community, and scripture combine. Hey, Christian Travelers, I'm so excited for you to get to hear from Mikkel today. But before we dive into that, I want to point you to our website, christiantravelers.net. There you'll find some awesome faith and travel resources. But Mikkel is here today to talk to us about how we can engage Gen Z and how we can make retreats one of the educational and engaging ways uh, we connect with them. Mikkel is a Christian apologetics professor at William Jessup University. He's also a PhD candidate in New Testament, cultural engagement manager, and host of the Table podcast at Dallas Theological Seminary. Hi, Mikkel. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Sarah. <laughs> it's really great having you here. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in youth ministry. Well, I grew up in a Christian home as a you know, Christian kid. My parents were actually in, involved in church quite a lot, doing missionary work, even with Campus Crusade for Christ. And so I had always heard the gospel before, but um, you know, it took a while as I was thinking through my faith, kind of mulling it over in junior high and high school. And it wasn't until I got into college that I got serious about my faith. And uh, that's really where the Lord started uh, introducing me to youth ministry. We had an outreach that we did to refugees in Orange County. And actually, they were kids who just kind of grew up into junior high and high school. And then my wife and I, who was uh, my girlfriend at the time, we were just dating. Uh, we just kind of became their youth leaders. And then after that, uh, we got married and we did youth ministry in the Philippines. We did missions with a group called the Baptist General Conference, now called Converge Worldwide. And after we got back to the States, um, God just had me teaching in Christian uh, schools where I had junior high students, high school students, and that even into where I actually became a youth pastor full time on staff at a church doing student ministry, junior high through college in Alameda in Northern California. So it always seems like wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, uh, God has me in some kind of a capacity doing student ministry. That's really awesome. And uh, does your wife then also help with ministry in all of those places? Yeah, she's really been a good partner where uh, sometimes it's funny, sometimes the students will come to me with Bible questions, but when it comes to like, hey, I'm fighting with my sister, they'll go to her. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, a little bit of the life questions, too. That's mm -hmm. awesome. So when it comes to youth ministry and engaging with Gen Z, um, what are some things that just right off the bat come to mind? I think oftentimes we think of them as millennials. I think we often oddly still associate them as a group that they no longer are. What makes them so different? Oh, wow. Um, Gen Z... <laughs> It's been said that Gen Z are kind of like millennials in all but optimism. <laughs> <laughs> and as a, as a parent who now has a Gen Z uh, kid, uh, I, I can see where that is. So where as some youth pastors will say, you know, in, in my day, the millennial youth pastors will say, we have to tell kids, you know, you, you can't really um, save the whole world. You know, they have to remind the, the Gen Z students to be to how, how to say this but to, to be more optimistic maybe <laughs> because on the one on the one hand like the previous generation would think well you know we can do anything we can fix the world and, it, and it's all great versus the other side now in gen z there's a lot more of hey society is just how it is and, and what can we really do especially with this pandemic right now mm -hmm. um, so many gen z students i mean gen z was like the number one generation struggling with depression and anxiety before the pandemic Mm. And so you can imagine now um, just the mental health issues that, that Gen Z is facing. Um, it's, it's, it's actually quite alarming. Mm -hmm. So when we think about engaging with Gen Z here, we have people who are one kind of, well, suspicious of authority, but also frustrated with all forms of authority right now, government, parents, uh, science, even 
um, just with the lockdowns and everything and, and having to be, many of them, very isolated. Um, so we have to recognize as people who are ministering to Gen Z that there's, there's that fragility there, but there's also resilience. And so we need to recognize both sides of the spectrum there, that there are, uh, there are also good opportunities as well amidst the difficulties to talk to people. Uh, I talked to Jonathan Morrow at Impact 360, who runs a, a Christian Gap here. And he says right now in his ministry, he says there's no better time to talk to people about things of eternal value. And I, I say that's really true um, because students are, yeah, they're lonely and, and there's, there's stuff that they're wrestling with. But what a great time to talk about how God can meet them in that need. Absolutely. And and speaking of that need, what are some topics that you think are really relevant to be talking with Gen Z about? Some of the topics that I like to talk about at retreats would be things like, is it okay to have doubts? Um, is it okay to have doubts about God? Um, how can you uh, kind of manage the, those, those questions in the back of, of your mind? Do you have to just chuck the faith and, and say, well, I can't figure this out, so maybe this isn't for me. Um, so I help people kind of navigate through, because um, I think that wrestling through those spiritual questions are arguably one way that people get really serious about their faith. Um, so that's kind of what happened to me. You know, Do I really believe this is true? Um, also, Gen Z as a whole is struggling with moral confusion in the sense of like, they're not entirely sure that what they say is is actually objectively true as a Christian. So they might say, you know, the Bible says this, but hey, that's just my opinion. Um, in a culture where tolerance and uh, making tolerance is, is a high virtue and making exclusive claims is kind of uh, pushed back on, they don't want to offend people. And so it's hard. Actually, the Barna Research Group did a study on Gen Z, and this was the top study where the top respondents were, <laughs> were I don't know. So it's like, is lying wrong? I don't know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, kind of moral relativism that needs to be addressed to help people understand that um, it's there are exclusive truth claims that Christianity makes, and you have to exclude the logical opposite of what that is. Um, of course, back to moral things, you know, questions about transgender issues, sexuality issues, uh, science and evolution, all those things students wrestle with. But uh, at its core, there really is that, that hesitancy to say that certain uh, truth claims are right and certain truth claims are wrong and that there is an objective moral standard. To me, I start thinking of like a middle schooler wrestling with identity and those kind of crisis. But what is the age range of Gen Z? What is that considered to be? So anybody who's in high school right now through just about to graduate college, so that age range. Um, so my own son is almost 17 right now, so he's right in there, right in the middle. So yeah, a lot of people um, think millennials are, are still, uh, you know, most of the college age people, but actually a lot of college age people are Gen Z now. Interesting. So you've had the opportunity to speak about a lot of these topics at retreats and plan things. And today I really want to kind of dive into how do we create an engaging environment? Um, what goes into planning a retreat, especially to engage Gen Z? When it comes to retreat, where do you even start? Well, if somebody approaches me to do a retreat for them. Sometimes they will have a passage in mind. Sometimes they'll have a theme, like a camp theme. Sometimes they'll have both. <laughs> so for example, I did one with the Southern Baptist Convention called Relentless. So it's just one word, relentless. And there was a, a passage, Luke 15, which is the parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. But I can't speak on that 10 times. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah. But so then I had to decide, okay, so there's the camp theme, relentless. It's kind of vague, but there it is. And what is so relentless about these three passages? So then I started thinking about really diving into the passages and looking at what the lessons were for the students there and what God wanted me to say to them. I wanted to say that God is relentless in his pursuit of you. He can meet you wherever you are, but that we also need to be relentless in our pursuit of God. And then kind of a, a tertiary thing was a relentless pursuit of truth with all these tough questions that we have about the faith. Um, can all religions be true? 
Um, is it okay for me to have doubts? I handled these kinds of things in the morning during the devos. And then at night when I did the, the big plenary talks, I decided to just go through uh, the parables of Jesus in, in that uh, Luke 15. But then also on either side of that, I looked just in the gospel of Luke as well for examples of God meeting people right where they are, right when they least expected it. So I started with the calling of Levi, for example. So that just kind of made sense to me. Um, so most of the time when you're when you're asked to do something like that, there will be some kind of a direction, but you should have the, the, the leeway to to kind of play around with it a little bit and, and uh, uh, expand on that camp theme. Once you have picked, uh, say, one of your um, relentless truth or one of your specific lessons that you're going to dive into, how do you go about writing your devotion or what what is your process there? So for me, writing a devotion starts with actually making the passage come alive to me. Uh, one quick tip, if you want to actually make your, your devos come to life and make them impactful, is they have to impact you first. And if they haven't impacted you, then keep studying your Bible until it impacts you. <laughs> and then now you have something to share. Uh, that way, it's not just like, I make a distinction between like a Bible lesson and, mm -hmm. and a, an actual message, you know, like, like a devo. So if you just say, well, here are the main points from this passage, well, okay, but does that really impact me? So when you get to that point, you can say how it impacted you and you can connect it to how it impacts others. Mm -hmm. What kind of elements do you use then to engage them and kind of hold their attention as you give your message? So the good thing about this is I'm, I'm easily distracted and bored. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if I'm bored while I'm talking, everyone else is bored too. <laughs> so uh, normally if people ask me to speak for a really long time, I'm not a big fan of, of super long uh, presentations. So if, if they say like 35 to 45 minutes, I'll make it 35 minutes. I might even make it 30 and, so, and show a video. So what I'll do to start out to, I'll, with an attention getter I was also a communications professor for a while, so this just follows the standard form. I start with an attention getter, then I move to a, a, a relevancy statement. So maybe your situation isn't like that illustration that I just shared to, to grab your attention, but the truth is every single one of us, whatever, you know, it has it relevant to us. Some credibility that actually looked into this, and then uh, preview, here's what we're going to do today. I reveal the topic, and then I say, here's what we're going to do. We'll look at you know, the parable of the lost uh, coin and then the lost sheep and then the lost son, for example. And then so I just kind of dive right into it that way. Um, I tend to use like movies and physical objects and tell stories to connect with people. So, for example, I show that famous Quicksilver scene from X-Men where he's going through the house and rescuing all the kids who are who are in danger because there's there's that explosion going off in the mansion in the X-Mansion. And so I tell them, what does a relentless pursuit look like? I said, this is one of my favorite scenes from X-Men, and I'll, I'll show you uh, this clip right now. So I showed it to them, and that, of course, actually got cheers and applause from the audience. This is a pretty cool scene. Uh, it's just a great way to involve students to be like, wow, okay, yeah, that really looks like, that is what a relentless pursuit looks like. And then I say, Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and he's relentless in his pursuit of you. And so I kind of connect it to something that, that will grab their attention. Um, and then later on for another talk, I actually showed a real life story of a dad, like a real life prodigal son, where the son like took his dad's car and drove to New York and then the dad just pursued him. He went there and looked all over for him um, to show how, what a real life relentless pursuit looks like. So things like that to bring it to life for them. I like the visual elements of that and just how engaging that has to be for them. And also like they started cheering even. So that's kind of a cool way to get their attention. Yeah. And I got a lot of credibility as someone who likes uh, superhero movies as well. <laughs> yeah. It helps you connect with them on a more personal level as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. After you, um, do these devotions kind of what is your hope that they take away i know it's different for each devotion but um kind of what's your goal going into it that you want them to walk away with well overall i'd like people at the retreats to really get to the point where they start to question do i really believe this or is this something that for a lot of a lot of 
students who come to these events, their parents are Christian, they come from a Christian home. And so that's the majority of the audiences that I normally speak to. But for them to really say, do I want a real relationship with God myself? And do I want that seriously enough to pursue it? Um, I want people to know it's okay for them to have doubts. I want people to know there are good answers to the hard questions. Like, does God exist? Are all, are all religions true? Uh, did Jesus rise from the dead? These are good questions, and they, they should not be afraid to pursue these things. Um, so sometimes I want them to just walk away with, as Greg Kokel from Stand to Reason likes to say, with a stone in their shoe, just giving them something to think about. So they walk away going, huh, I got to think about that. Sometimes I want to do, I want them to do something very, very concrete. Like I want to teach people how to turn to God. How do you repent? How do you ask God to, to forgive you for something that you did? Um, psychologists will tell you that people don't know how to ask each other to forgive them, let alone how do you ask God to forgive you? And so something as simple as walking through the steps to, to how to repent, how to turn back to God and just, just own it and say, God, you know, I, I messed up here and this is wrong and I'm sorry. Um, and then we do it together. So it's like right now, I want you to bow your head and I want you to think of that one thing. You know, sometimes when we, we say we want our audience to be challenged to do this, sometimes they can do it right there and then. And so you know that they're doing it because you're leading them in it right there and then. Or at least you hope they're doing it, you know, but you give them an opportunity to do it during the talk. That's a really good way to model how to do really anything, to demonstrate it first, to do it with them, and then kind of observe them do it on their own, and then they can do it on their own. And you might not get all of those steps in a speech, but that is a great way, as you said, to have them do it hands-on in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at the end of all of this, have you ever had people like come up to you afterwards or want to engage you even after they've returned home um, with discussion on furthering that topic? Oh yeah, all the time, especially right after an event, people will come and talk to me. You know, sometimes there's a line to, to get through and you, you want to spend as much time as you can with each, with each person there. But I'll tell you one of the really standout things that happened once was when I was a youth pastor in Alameda, I was doing this thing called Bay Area Youth Unite, and I was trying to get all these youth groups together for Big Praise and Worship Night. And this one guy was a youth pastor also at, a, at an area church, and he came to speak with me, and I kind of gave him a tour of the church. And then he said, you remember when you spoke at this one place at Azusa Pacific University? I'm like, I remember that. And then I'm going to pause the story right here and tell you what I was thinking when I was on the stage at that event. I had just come back from the Philippines. I was really quite tired and and I, I took this speaking engagement and I did it, but I really didn't feel like I did that great of a job or it just, I didn't feel, feel like it really went that well. And I got back on the plane. I was like, well, okay, God, I was faithful to you. I did what you asked. I hope somebody was blessed by this, but if not, at least you use this to, to provide for my family um, at this time where we just came back from the mission field and, and didn't have an income. Well, fast forward to that story in Alameda, that man told me I became a Christian at that thing where you spoke. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. Thank you, God. Um, so let that be a testimony to anybody who, you know, you feel like maybe your Devo kind of fell flat or maybe it didn't get the response you thought about. Well, maybe God's using that just to, to speak to one person. And maybe there was more than one person who was impacted by those talks that I thought, oh, well, I did these things, and I guess I hope someone was blessed by them, but I didn't really see the fruit. Well, maybe we'll get to see more of those people in heaven. So just that, let that be an encouragement to our listeners. Amen. Uh, that's so true. The power of one. I feel like sometimes in church ministry, just like it can be so discouraging when one kid shows up for an event or uh, one kid even is even interested in attending a retreat, but God can do some amazing wonders even just with one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you've been doing these speaking gigs, you have had the challenge of packing for and traveling to them and all of the things that go into that and bringing those engaging elements with you that you had talked about. What are some of your tips for packing as a speaker? So this is a really cool question because nobody ever asks me that, but I'm kind of a minimalist and I love 
thinking about packing. It's crazy. It's kind of like a hobby for me, but nobody ever asks me about it. <laughs> so I can travel the world with a North Face Borealis backpack that fits under the seat of any airplane, whether I'm traveling around the world for a month or more, or I'm doing a, a two to three day thing at an event. And so a lot of it has to do with clothes I buy at REI, first of all, <laughs> really, really lightweight things that uh, can dry in a hotel room. And oftentimes I'll only just bring like, you know, uh, one extra change of clothes. And as long as there's a hotel room sink, everything's good. As far as the, um, actually let me back up. If I'm on the stage for multiple days, I can't always wear the same shirt, right? Right. But I can wear the same pants and nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> I actually tried it once where I wore the same shirt two days in a row. And during the Q&A, I kid you not, somebody went up to the mic and their question was, how many white shirts do you have? <laughs> <laughs> After that, I never wore the same shirt two nights in a row. Oh, yeah. But Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to 2021. For your safety and comfort, please remain seated with your seatbelt fastened for the insane deals the travel industry is offering as they make their comeback from this pandemic. The fastened seatbelt light will remain on until you book your bucket list trip at a fraction of the cost you would have a year ago. Please check around your seat for any personal belongings and check with us to find out how we can rebook you if your travel dates change. At this time, you may use your cell phones to call Christian Travelers Network at 615-241-2151 or email us at christiantravelersnetwork at gmail.com to learn what deals our travel agency can provide that aren't available to the general public or to find out more about our faith-based travel resources. On behalf of Christian Travelers Network, I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast and we look forward to traveling with you again when you are ready. Anyway, um, the things I bring are small and light. So for example, I have a deck of cards, very, very small, very light. A deck of cards, I'll bring a student up on stage, do a little magic trick with him and, uh, or her. And just that's an example for one of the talks I give on intelligent design. What are the chances that a magic trick like that was just random? No, it was designed by me, the person doing the illusion. In the same way, we see the earmarks of design in nature as we take a look at the things that God has made. Um, there's an inflatable elephant that I bring for uh, one of my talks on can all religions be true? And it's, it's the, for the parable of the, uh, or the, the story of the blind men and the elephant, that traditional story uh, that talks about a variety of religions and, and how we should view religion. Uh, there's a little special twist I put on that to, to show that um, we really need to listen to God, to the king, because if it wasn't for him, how would we really know what truth was? We'd just be like everybody else kind of bumping around in the dark and like the blind men in the story, touching the elephant, not knowing what they were touching. <laughs> but it's inflatable and it's very, very light. And so that packs down very small as well. Um, there's another thing where I need, I need a soccer ball. Now, I'm not going to put a soccer ball in my backpack because that'd be the end of that. No more space, right? So you can also ask the people, ask the church that asked you to, to speak ask the conference or the camp, do you guys have this? Do you guys have that? And it'd be so much easier for the people at the venue to provide you with a soccer ball or with some other larger kind of prop that you might need. So you don't have to bring it. That's very smart and uh, crazy that you can pack all of that and travel for a month at a time with just one backpack. Yeah. So sometimes people ask me, are you an outdoorsy type? And not really in the in the, in the typical, typical way that people think outdoorsy people are, but just because I travel so much, mm. uh, people ask me that. And but the guy who asked me that, you know, he was he was a you know like a REI co-op member, and he knew like, well, you're wearing cool and prana and all these <laughs> things that uh, clearly come from REI. I said, yeah, well, they they wash pretty easy in the sink, you know, in hotels. So yeah. that's that's my traveling attire, and cost effective too, at least yes. maintaining that, yeah. Very much so. Do you have any other things that you want to share about reaching Gen Z, planning retreats, uh, traveling, etc.? I think we also need to make sure that we reach both the head and the heart in this time. So it's important to equip students um, to answer tough questions about the faith and wrestle with those things, but also to ask them, how can I pray for you? How are you doing right now? 
because a lot of people right now, especially, are feeling super fragile. I ask students, how are you feeling right now? And they'll say fragile, uh, exasperated, you know, more, more anxious than normal. And so to ask them, you know, where, where is God in the midst of things that are disappointing for me? Have them ask that, you know, um, where does everything look different for me now? And how do I navigate that? Because students are asking these kinds of things. And, and also, is, is Christianity good? Because some people are not asking if Christianity is true because they're not even sure if it's good. And so sometimes we need to back up and show that God's moral commands are there for our uh, flourishing, for our benefit. And they're not there to take away our fun. They're actually there because God knows how, how human beings were designed to function and were designed to flourish. What a world it would be if people lived by, say, the sexual ethic that Jesus taught. So what a world would it be where there was no sexual abuse, where every kid had a mom and a dad, where there was no need for a hashtag me too movement, these kinds of things. Isn't this a beautiful world that, that people can agree? Yeah, that would be awesome. Well, this is why God gives us his moral commands and not to take away um, from positive things from us, but actually to help us flourish. And so we need to show people that these things uh, aren't just true because you don't say, well, it's true because it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible because it's actually true. And this is the best way for human beings to flourish. God's commands are there to help us um, live the way that we were intended to live and to flourish as, as individuals and as a society. Absolutely. And I really like what you said there, because I feel like just with all of the confusion there seems to be uh, with politics, with pandemic, with um, just all the things seeming to go on in our nation, I, it, I don't think it's even just limited to Gen Z. I think all of us in some way um, can feel the impact that is God taking away when really he's giving us something to flourish with. And um, it can be hard to verbalize that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Mikkel, one of the questions I always like to ask our guests is, what has been the biggest God moment in all of your travels? Hmm. So there was one time I was trying to get to Canada, and it was really quite uh, complicated where I was supposed to fly from Sacramento to Washington, meet other speakers who were there, drive with them into uh, British Columbia to speak at a church in Coquitlam. And long story short, that wasn't going to happen because that flight got canceled and there was no way I was going to be able to meet them and they were just going to have to leave without me. And so I was like, oh God, I'm going to miss this conference. And there is no way I can get to speak now because I can't be in, in Washington to, to meet these guys and drive over the border with them. So all of a sudden this this one woman motions to me to come over to the desk. And she said, where are you trying to go? And I said, I'm actually not going to Washington. I need to go to Vancouver. And if I bought a ticket to go to Vancouver, it would have been hundreds of dollars more, which is why I bought a ticket to go to Washington and meet these guys um, on, the, on the border and drive over. So then she takes my ticket and gives me a ticket to Vancouver. And she said, if anybody asks you, I couldn't help you here, Capiche. Like, okay, <laughs> thank you. And then and then she closed the 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 kiosk and didn't help anybody else. And I'm like, well, thank you, God. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> um, so little things like like I don't know why she uh, she just singled me out like that, but little things like that remind me that God's God's watching out for, for me. And if he did call me to go to Canada to do that talk, that he was going to make a way for me to do it. And that I, that's why I didn't miss it. That's wonderful. Crazy how God works sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Well, we have really enjoyed having you on the podcast. How can our listeners connect with you uh, outside of this episode? Yeah, thanks for asking. You can visit my website at apologeticsguy.com. Also, please uh, connect with me on social media. I'm Apologetics Guy on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And also, you can check out The Table podcast at dts.edu slash the table. It's a video podcast, and it's available on all, all audio platforms as well, on Google, on Apple Podcasts, 
Amazon, Spotify, and at wherever you listen to the show. Wonderful. And we will make sure to have links to those in the description below. But thanks so much for sharing with us how to connect with Gen Z and some of your tips and tricks for leading messages and devotions at retreats. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks so much for inviting me to be on the show, Sarah. Yes, thank you. Well, Christian Travelers, I hope that you have enjoyed listening to Mikkel. It has been awesome hearing his advice. And if you are looking to book your own trip or adventure, uh, consider booking with us, Christian Travelers Network. You can find links to our bookings and our Facebook, Instagram, etc. on our website, christiantravelers.net. We just revealed our 2021 travel theme, which is Recline at the Table. You can find more details also on our website uh, or listen to our episode 89, uh, which is the theme reveal itself. But until next time, safe travels and God bless.